Well, welcome to the afternoon meeting house. My name is Ryan. I'll be arranging for the next 10 minutes or so. And um, this is a very important historic site here in downtown Boston. Um, it's a private museum. It's a museum of African American history that works in partnership with the National Park Service. That's who I work for, is the National Park Service. And we've been working together since 1980 to make sure these buildings get preserved and stay preserved and that the stories keep getting told here. All right. Now, when most people think history in Boston, they think about the revolution, right? Paul Revere, Bunker Hill. Okay, Boston's kind of known the world over as that cradle of liberty for that first American revolution. Think about our story as the next generation. We're in the 1800s now. That's 1760s, 1770s. We're going to go up to the 1800s and make our way up to the Civil War, all right? And look at Boston's leading role in the second American Revolution. And by that, I'm referring to the fight against slavery, the abolitionist struggle, which I think you can very safely say no city in this country did more in that fight than Boston did. And certainly no community within the city did more in that fight than the free black community that was living here. All right. Now immediately following that first revolution, 1783, same year we signed the peace treaty with England and everything, is the same year that the Supreme Court of this new state of Massachusetts declared slavery unconstitutional. So Massachusetts is actually the first state to abolish slavery. And the, the black community here was a free black community, about a thousand people strong in Boston in the 1780s. And by the time of the Civil War, where our story is going to end, we're talking about maybe 2,500, maybe 3,000 people. So numerically, this is a small group of people. But what was huge was the influence they had turned in Boston into the engine of that anti-slavery movement, you know, the abolitionist struggle, um, what we'll call a civil rights movement all right, of the 1840s and 50s, uh, the Underground Railroad, that secret network of getting people out of slavery up to the free states, and actually eventually to Canada after the passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. And these guys are also leaders during the Civil War. All right? And all those stories come together right here in this building, the African Meeting House, because this was the center of that free black community. This place went up in 1806, been with us for 210 years, um, and this was really the heart and soul of this neighborhood. Uh, it originally went up as the um, home for the first African Baptist church, so it's a house of worship. It's the oldest standing black church in the country. All right? It quickly became a school, though, as well. Downstairs was used as a privately run school known as the African School, which was uh, shows you that you know, there, even though there wasn't slavery here in Massachusetts, there was a far cry from equality. At first, the public schools would not allow black children to attend. So the ministers to here, Thomas Paul, said build a school downstairs. So the church, private school. Eventually, the city built where you guys just met me, the Abiel Smith School, which is the first black public schoolhouse in the nation. All right? You've walked around, you've seen the exhibits, um, but it's really not that big of a place. If we're being generous, we can say it's two and a half floors, right? But it's more like two and a half rooms, okay? They'd pack 160, 170 kids in that building on any given day. It was overcrowded, underfunded, and therefore that school became this focal point in an equal schools fight or a civil rights fight back in the 1840s and 50s, which was driven by this community, particularly by this guy named William Cooper Mill, who knew firsthand how bad the education was. He was educated downstairs. Realized that the white kids were getting up the street at the Phillips School and vowed to himself at 13 years old to not stop fighting until he got equal education for everybody. His dream was integration, that equality through integration. As he became an adult for 15 years, he was standing right where I am, organizing this community against that building. They launched protests against it, speaking campaigns against it, boycotts, people pulled their kids out of school, all right? None of that worked. They tried suing the city, they took the city to court, didn't work. But what Nell did was a total of seven different petitions. First to the mayor of the school committee, which weren't working, but he finally does the statewide petition. He collects thousands of signatures from throughout, throughout Massachusetts, saying close down the black school, get equal integrated education. And Massachusetts listened to him. In 1855, he marched those petitions up to our state house. The legislature signed the law, the governor signed, made the law, the governor signed it. Massachusetts, 1855, became the first state to outlaw segregation of its public schools. The Smith School closed down. It later became a warehouse and a veterans post. And about 20 years ago, it opened up as the exhibit space for the museum, late 90s. Um, that's just a major, that's a major civil rights development. Integrating the schools in 1855 in Massachusetts puts them 99 years ahead of the Supreme Court of the United States, Brown versus the Board of Education of the people. But there were other civil rights accomplishments. These guys worked with Frederick Douglass, who spoke here time and time again. With his help, they integrated the trains in the 1840s. They integrated juries 
1860, if you think about important jury services. And they also had to create a marriage up here in 1843. The country didn't do it. The Supreme Court didn't do it until 1967. So you're the wow. one. Isn't that crazy? That's incredible. Civil rights accomplishments, 100, and in the case of marriage, 124 years ahead of the rest of the nation. Okay? okay. That only happened because this community here made it happen. They were forcing Massachusetts to change its old discrimination laws. And that, they're the ones that pushed Massachusetts, like I said, 100 years ahead of the rest of the nation. And that's just the local stuff. All right? There's also that national fight against slavery that was very much birthed here. This was the meeting ground of many abolition groups, including the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, um, including the Freedom Association, which was an alliance of people here in the city working to uh, fund the Underground Railroad, helping people escape from slavery. This was also the birthplace of the Massachusetts General Colored Association in 1826. It was uh, the black leaders of the city came together to push for the immediate end of slavery and wipe out all the discrimination laws of the state. Frederick Douglass said that was the first real abolitionist group in the country. Because they weren't looking just for the end of slavery. They were looking for the end of slavery and equality for everybody. That's what made them that much more radical. All right? These guys, uh, this building here was also served as the um, birthplace of William Lloyd Garrison's famous group, the uh, New England Anti-Slavery Society. It was 11 white men joined that group with Garrison right here in this building um, in 1832. And what happened within a few months as those two groups merged, the Massachusetts General Public Association, New England Anti-Slavery Society, they kept grabbing more chapters, they kept grabbing more people, and it morphed itself into the American Anti-Slavery Society, the largest national organization pushing for the end of slavery. It's got its roots in these two groups that were born right here. All right? And this is what Garrison said that night. He said, tonight we're meeting in this obscure little schoolhouse. Our numbers are limited, but mark my words, the principles and the ideas that we set forth here in this room are going to shape the nation with their mighty power. And that turned out to be a really good prediction on his part. You don't shake a nation too much more than civil war. And these abolitionists had a huge part to do with that. And the building's got civil war history. Massachusetts was a leader during the civil war. We had an abolitionist governor. His name was John Andrew. When the war broke out in 1861, he sent the first white soldiers south. All right? But when enough pressure was put on Abraham Lincoln for him to finally allow black soldiers to serve in his army, uh, Massachusetts Governor Andrew also sent out the first black regiment as well. And that's the famous 54th Regiment. It's starting to be a dated reference, but does anyone remember the movie Glory? Yes. Glory? No, you do? Yeah. No? Check, you gotta check it out. Glory, check it out. It's uh, about 27 years old at this point. It came out in the late 80s. But it's a great um, dramatic uh, movie about the, the creation of this first Northern Black Regiment. But the tie to this building is the 54th Regiment were recruited right here. Okay, this is where they came to sign up and say, yeah, I want to be part of that. And part of the reason they kept coming here is because they had the greatest recruiters out there looking for that, local leaders, like Louis Haig. You saw these guys in the film next door. Or if you haven't seen the film, you get a chance to see it. Great local leaders recruiting, but also national leaders recruiting for these guys, including Frederick Douglass, the most famous abolitionist in our country's history. Um, he went across the north telling these black men, drop what you're doing and make your way to Boston and join the 54th Regiment, because that's the only way into the <coughs> at that point. He gave this great speech called Men of Color to Arms. And within this much longer speech, a 20-minute speech, which I'm not going to recite, he does carve out a nice little paragraph about the legacy of what happened here. He said, we can get at the throat of treason and slavery through the state of Massachusetts. Then he tells us why. She, Massachusetts, was first in the War of Independence, first to break the chains of her slaves, first to make black men equal before the law, first to admit colored children to her common schools, first to answer with her blood the alarm cry of the nation when the capital was menaced by the rebels. You know our patriotic governor, that was the abolitionist John Andrew, and you know Charles Sumner, who was our senator back then, a great anti-slavery senator. He said, I need to add no more. Massachusetts now welcomes you as her soldiers. So in those few short words, like 30 seconds worth of writing, Douglas is able to capture that almost 100-year history of abolitionist Boston and the crucial role that this community played in making Massachusetts that much far ahead of the rest of the country. I can't think of a more ringing endorsement for the central role that this community played than out of the mouth of Frederick Douglass. Okay. I really wish he gave that speech here, but he didn't. It would make, it'd make it even better if he gave that speech <laughs> here. But he was going across the country and telling folks to come here and sign up. So, so if we fast forward 100 years, um, 
The um, Museum of African American History was founded in the 1960s. They're turning 50 years old next year. All right? And it was founded by a woman named Sue Bailey Thurman, who was one of the mentors to Martin Luther King when he was uh, studying up here at Boston University. And what um, Sue Bailey Thurman said was, uh, one way we can inspire the fight of the 1960s was by looking back at what these guys were able to do all those years before. She said, we need a museum of African American history to do that. So she founds this place in the 60s. She purchases this building from the synagogue, which it had become in the early 1970s. And it's been the primary artifact and historic site of the museum since then. And then where my group comes in, the federal government, uh, National Park Service was created uh, as a partner to this uh, museum in 1980 by Jimmy Carter. He created Boston African American National Historic Site, where you are now, and Martin Luther King National Historic Site <laughs> down in Atlanta on the very same day. And I really oh, really? Wow. I did on purpose, yeah. And I really think that was his way and the Park Service's way and the American people's way of commemorating forever, you know, two centuries of civil rights action in this country. And the beautiful thing about national parks is once they make you a national park, it's tough to get rid of you. So I think this place will still be here. Uh, if you want to bring your kids and grandkids, will still be here, you know, in the future. So, um, Just in terms of the building itself, it has been restored. Uh, so this is what it looks like. This is based on what it looked like back in the 1850s. They had blueprints from back then. Um, the benches are recreated, but they're based on the, the original one, which is at the end of this row right here. You can go sit on it, it's fine. And the thing I think is so cool that they're able to keep for us, though, is the floors. So you're actually standing on the same floors as all those folks from back in the day. <laughs> you know, you're sharing that space with them. So I'm going to hang out over there if you have any questions. If not, feel free to look around, take pictures. And I would actually go up there and stand there and just get a feeling of what it's like. And you can take pictures of yourself up there if you want. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, You're thank you so much. You're welcome. You woke up, huh? <laughs> yeah, she's been up for a while. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she is. She's she's a good little girl. She's a very good little girl. So, this is beautiful. It's amazing. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good in you. God made them a wonderful church. Yes. So this is the first, what kind of church it is? First African Baptist Church of Boston. First African Baptist Church of Boston. And it's the first, what kind of church in the nation again? It's the oldest standing black the church. The oldest standing black church in yeah. the nation. That's what this is. Yeah, there were earlier churches, but they're just no longer physically still around. Okay. There. And so Maria Stewart spoke here, right? Yep. yep. 1833. 1833. She yep. spoke here. Um, On uh, women's rights and anti-slavery. Women's rights and anti-slavery. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, female speakers? The Grimke sisters. The Grimke sisters. Yep. Oh, they spoke here they too. They spoke here as well, yeah. Wow. Um, and then many members of that um, Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. Um, so those would be more local names, like um, William Cooper Nell's mother, I think her name was Louisa, the, the guy that integrated the schools. His mother was a... What about Sarah Red Ramon from Salem? Would she have I, spoken I, I, here? I think it's likely. I don't know for sure. I haven't seen that um, okay. written down, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Well, they would have... Uh... So what was their de denomination is the question. They would have spoken right here. Yeah. Baptist was the church. Baptist. Baptist was the denomination. And they would have spoken right here. And so, uh, no, this, this, this is not a working church, right? No. no, it's a museum. This is a museum. So it's the oldest standing um, black church in the nation, and, and it's a museum. So these are the original floors, and then some of those benches in the back are the originals. Oh, fantastic. Yes, so you should definitely come. So um, thanks for joining, you guys. I'm going to let you guys go, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you for joining.